Good morning. Happy Lord's Day. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. This is the second lesson in the book of James. We'll be beginning in chapter 1, beginning in verse 21, and then carrying into chapter 2 of James. And as you see on this title screen, some of the things we'll be covering, be doers of the word, not hearers only. Receive with meekness the implanted word. That's a powerful thing. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. Faith without works is dead and do not show partiality. That's kind of an overview of what we'll be studying today. But first, let's pray together. Dear Lord, I just lift up this lesson. May it speak to our hearts what, what each of us need to hear. Lord, I, I claim that promise. Your word will not return void, but will accomplish its purpose. Speak to each heart, Lord. And I ask you, Lord, to be with those prayer requests that are on people's hearts, whether it's those that have lost loved ones, Lord, and some still grieving, Lord, and have gone through a very difficult time. I, I lift them up to you. I lift up those who are ill and those who have loved ones that are ill and friends, Lord, and others that just have a burden for other people that want to want to pray for them as well. Lord, you know what each prayer request is, and I lift them up to you. Speak to us through your word. Bring honor to your name. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to pick up from last week in verse 21. We're going to start there. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Um, so this is basically talking about getting rid of those things in life. This is The book of James is about Christianity in the real world. So what we need to do is we need to get rid of those things that are not pleasing to God, those things that pull us down, filthiness and wickedness. And, but we need to receive from God with meekness the implanted word. Now, what does that mean? It means when you receive from God the implanted word, there's a verse that says um, that his word does not return void, but will accomplish its purpose. And, and so God does implant his word in us. It says to be rooted and grounded in his word. Let the word of God, it, it's like planting a seed and faith grows from it. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's a verse in Jeremiah that, that says, look at the almond tree. He said, it's about to bloom. He said, I'm ready to perform my word. Talking about it's time. God is ready for his word to perform. Just like when the blossoms come out, you know that the fruit will start coming soon too. So it will bring forth good. So he's saying, get rid of the, the old stuff, the old man, put in new good stuff and receive with meekness. Meekness is strength under control. It's like having self-control. It's very, it's, it's strong. Jesus was the meekest ever lived and he was the strongest ever lived. But at the same time, he was to discipline himself and able to receive it. So with meekness, it means be teachable. Let God teach you and receive what God wants you to get out of the word of God. Uh, and it is able to save your soul. <clears throat> this word is so powerful because through it, you can find out the words of salvation and how to meet God and how to go to heaven. I mean, that's pretty powerful. And then it goes on and it says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in all he does. You know, I, I remember a preacher one time saying here that you only believe the amount of word that you're willing to practice. And there is some truth to that. And that's what he's talking about. He says, look, it's not, it's good to hear the word, but it's even better to do the word, whatever the word says and take it to heart and to learn from it and ask God to help you grow from it. So he compares it to this, that the one who doesn't, that hears the word but doesn't do it, is like somebody who looks at his natural face in a mirror. 
You know, we look at a mirror sometimes to see, you know, what we look like, but at the same time, you see things that maybe you don't like. There's blemishes, there's there's things that you don't like about yourself, but then going deeper, there may be character flaws, there may be other things, there's things about us that you really want to see changed. But somebody who's not a, a doer of the word is like, they're like, okay, God showed me this, and I see that I lack some things from the word of God. But then you go away from it, and you forget, and then the, the last state of that person is worse than the first, because you forgot what type of man, you didn't make the corrections God was trying to make you a better person, to get you closer to him. His word always tries to draw you in. But then it says, but the one who does, it's like you look at the perfect law of liberty and you continue in it. And you're not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one is blessed in all he does. You know, Jesus sees who we are and who we can become. He looked at Simon Peter. He says, you are Simon, but you will be called Peter. In other words, I see who you are now with your faults and everything that goes with it, but I also see who you can become in Christ. And, and God looks at each of us that way. But the Word of God is so incredible because it can speak to each of us what each of us need. And then it speaks to each of us differently. So it's an amazing way God speaks to us through His Word to teach us. That's why I encourage Bible study to everyone. To, to Bible study on your own for certain, but also to fellowship with other believers and to also be a part of a group Bible study. It's really a good idea and it really helps you understand what God wants. And it helps us keep in check by looking in that mirror all the time at what God wants. If anyone among you thinks he's religious, and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. You know, when, when it says this, that if, you, if your mouth doesn't match what you're saying you are, then your religion is useless. In other words, if you tell everybody you're a Christian, but what comes out of your mouth is far from Christian, then it says your religion is vain. You know, and, and it, it's... Our, our conversation needs to reflect what's in our heart. It does reflect what's in our heart. And it's not what goes in a man that defiles a man, it's what comes out of him. And so the, we have to be very careful. That's why he said, let your conversation be seasoned with salt. Let's build up the body of Christ and not tear it down. The, the mouth and the tongue can do much damage, uh, but we need to be very careful how we live, because if our life doesn't reflect what we want people to, to, to know about God, then, you know, it's useless is what this says. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Okay, so this is two parts involved in this. First, you know, the things that we do, the ministry we do, visit orphans and, and widows. You know, you're doing that out of the love of God and obedience to God. That's pure and undefiled religion. You're, you're doing the things the Bible teaches. But also keep yourself unspotted from the world. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the fathers is not in him. <clears throat> and, the, and the world consists of the pride of life the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. And these things and these desires from the world, um, these, these are the things that, that, that really hurt us as believers. And we need to be aware of that. And it affects the way we live. But to keep oneself unspotted from the world, you know, I'm thinking we're in the world, but we don't have to be of the world. We don't have to participate in the things the world does, but we're going to be in the world. And... You know, when you're, when you're walking in the world, just don't let things rub off on you and you be spotted by it. In other words, don't let others influence you to do things you know are not right. And so keep yourself unspotted from the world. Chapter 2. My brethren, do not hold 
uh, the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there is one who comes in your assembly, a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith <clears throat> and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? So, so here it goes into this partiality part that, you know, as Christians, we shouldn't be showing partiality. Whether it's your position in life um, or, or whatever it may be, people that are different than us, people that speak a different language, whatever it may be, we're not to show partiality. We're to show love to all. God created all people for the glory of God. And when we show partiality, we're sinning against God, and it's very clear in Scripture that we are. In fact, it's fixing to say that very thing. So, you know, and then he gives the example, the poor in this world are the ones that, you know, God has given the kingdom of God to. But then he says, but the rich, they're the ones that drag you into the courts. They're the ones that can can take advantage of you and, and you owe them and things like that. So you have to be very careful because you, you want certain things to happen, but you're showing partiality. Partiality is not in the Christian life, and it shouldn't be. And uh, it goes on and it says, if you really fulfill the royal... Oh, do not... Let me go back one verse. Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? In other words, the noble name, you're, you're under nobility. You're, not, you're under a king. You're a king's kid. And, and so you're a, no, a noble child. So they, they blaspheme that noble name and take advantage. And yet we, we give in to those who are popular and those who, who have prestige and things like that. But yet we need to honor those of lesser degree and honor people and keep, treat them all the same, regardless, and love them all in Jesus' name. And... And it says, if you really fulfill the royal law, here's talking about the royal law. That means it was given by royalty, the, the word of God. If we fulfill the royal law, according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that's all people. Let me tell you, one thing Jesus came down the hardest on was people who were prejudiced. When he, when he on purpose, went through the land of the Samaritans, and, and he, would, he would reach out to the Samaritans, and he even said, who is my neighbor? And he gave the example of the good Samaritan. And so you have to realize that Jesus tries to tear down those barriers. He, tries, he wants to reach all people. And so it says, if you show partiality then you're committing a sin and a transgression. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. So it says if we fail in this one area, it's just like we broke all the Ten Commandments. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but you murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Praise God for that. So it says here that, that the one who shows no mercy, it says there'll be no mercy shown to them in judgment. And so that's, it, it says, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. That's the opposite of that. And, and then it, it says this powerful thing that, that mercy triumphs judgment. Aren't you glad? Because we have nothing to offer God. I mean, salvation is of God, and he's the one that calls us to salvation. We have nothing to offer him. 
to, what can we give a perfect God who loves us and died for us and all perfect things come from him? And yet what can we give to him that he doesn't need anything except our life? And when we give him our life, he says he shows mercy and he overlooks judgment. I mean, praise God, mercy triumphs <laughs> judgment. That is a powerful verse. But in the same way, we should be merciful and will be shown mercy. It will come back to you. It's like those who water others will be watered themselves, it says in Proverbs. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does, does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked or destitute of daily food, and one of them says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give him the things which are needed for the body, what is it profited? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Again, it's kind of like what comes out of your mouth can destroy what you say you are. Same thing in faith. If you, if you go by someone who needs food and they're asking for food and you don't meet the need if you're able to, and you don't meet that need, then you're not really helping them. You're not showing faith by, by not helping them. And so the same way it says, you know, we need to, uh, when, when, when you believe, there should be things that follow us. In other words, faith is something that other people notice you have because you act in a way that they can tell you're a believer. They can tell that, well, he acts differently or she acts differently. Or that's a godly woman or a godly man because, man, look at the way they, they, their, their life reflects that their hearts changed. And that's the way our life should be. Now, we know we're all saved by grace and faith and not of works lest anyone should boast. We're not saved by works. We can't earn our salvation. But if we have faith, works will follow. And that's what he's saying. Works will follow to show that we do have faith. It's an example of that faith. So then he goes on and he says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, you'll be able to see I have faith by the way I live. And I want to, to, to explain it to you, but you'll be able to see it by the things you do. Um, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. You know, that's a scary thought because what he's saying here, he's saying, well, I believe, but yet there's no evidence of your faith. There's nothing to indicate you're a Christian. You know, and, and yet at the same time, you say, yeah, but I believe. But then he says, yeah, but so do the demons believe. But, and, but yet they tremble and they're not saved. And, and so it, it says, don't just go on that only there has, you want it to take, you want to have a relationship with God to where it makes a difference in your life, to where he changes and con converts the soul and changes your heart. But you do not want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead. In other words, the same thing. If you don't have works, then your faith is dead. There's nothing to it. It's, it's not alive. It's not real. It was not... <clears throat> Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? In other words, Abraham showed he believed God when he was asked to do something that was really hard to do, to give his only son. But yet what he didn't realize is God was going to teach a powerful lesson through that that one day God would give his only son. And of course, God provided a substitute, just like he'll provide a substitute for us. But yet God didn't spare his own son when it came to that price because he had to pay the price for us. But yet it shows here that Abraham acted out his faith by what he did and believed. And Abraham showed that throughout his life. He believed God and it was accounted to God as righteousness because his works followed his faith. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. And see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. 
but this is justified, not saved. So what it's saying is he's saying, you will notice your faith by your works, and it will follow. Like, likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received messengers and sent them out another way? Well, the reason, you know, she showed faith, even though she was a harlot, she was a different character than Abraham, but yet at the same time, she exhibited faith because she said, I believe in your God and I want you to spare me when you come in because she believed in the living God. And so she was spared because of her action by letting them out another way. And they said, put a scarlet cord around that rope. And when we see that out there, we'll spare your family. And God honored her faith by her actions. She followed what they told her to do. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. It's just like that. It says, if you say you know God and you know about God, you know about Jesus, but you don't have the Holy Spirit, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior and asked him to come in your life, that's Christ in you, the hope of glory. He comes in the person of the Holy Spirit to abide with us. He shall be with us and he shall be in us. He is the one that comes into our life. And if we've rejected the Holy Spirit, then it says we're dead. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, if we just have the Father and the Son, then we, we, we're dead. We're, we, we don't have a relationship with God. But if we have the Spirit of God, then we have a relationship with God. His Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. For as the body without the Spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. God bless you. Have a blessed week. Let's close. Thank you for your word, Lord. And I ask you to speak to people through this lesson and bring honor to your name. In Jesus' name, amen.